it's a very special evening tonight. A very warm welcome to all of you. Thank you very much for coming to, uh, to have this evening uh, with us and celebrate the first officially invited lecture uh, we host um, uh, at the Chapurji Palonji Institute. And it uh, gives me a huge pleasure to introduce our first speaker tonight um, on this event, Professor Philip Cranebrook, who is by no means new to SOAS. In fact, Professor Cranebrook is an alumnus of SOAS. After doing his first uh, uh, and second degrees at the University of Amsterdam and Utrecht, Professor Cranebrook came to SOAS to do a postgraduate degree in Zoroastrianism, Old and Middle Iranian languages, and in Gujarati. And I assume you studied here with some of our great uh, people at SOAS, Professor Mary Boyce, of course, and Professor Nicholas Sims Williams, and uh, other colleagues. He was, um, he's my, uh, the same age as me. Uh, <laughs> Professor McKenzie. Professor McKenzie, yes, of course, Nicholas was so young. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And uh, so he uh, was here at SOAS and studied uh, Iranian, did Iranian studies. Um, and then he took up a lectureship at the University of Utrecht while completing a PhD at the University of Leiden. And he was awarded his PhD in 1982. Between 1988 and 1996, Philip was then senior lecturer in modern Iranian languages. Uh, a reader. I was a lecturer and a reader. Oh, yes. Between no, no, yes, I do apologize. Between 1988 and 1996, you were senior lecturer in modern Iranian languages here at SOAS. And uh, then you were invited to take up a chair in Iranian studies at the University of Göttingen, from which uh, you uh, retired uh, in 2017. 2016. Now, Professor Cranebrook's wide-ranging research covers the areas of Zoroastrianism, of Yezidism, of minority religions among the Kurds, oral literatures and culture, ancient Iranian literature, and memory in Iranian cultures. Of course, it's impossible in this short introduction to do full justice to the breadth and the depths of his work, but I would just like to highlight two particular areas um, in which he has made huge contributions. One is Zoroastrianism, and the other one is this, uh, Kurdish religion and Yezidism. Professor Cranebrook established himself as an authority in Zoroastrian studies with a study of Srausha in the Zoroastrian tradition, a book published in 1985. The core text of this deity has survived to the present day in Avestan and Middle Persian versions, and Professor Cranebrook has provided a pioneering edition, translation, commentary of both of these versions and a very detailed study of the figure of Srausha. Another of Professor Cranebrook's key contributions to scholarship is his collaborative work with the high priest as steward, Dr. Firoz Kotwal, on the priestly treatises, the Habedistan and the Nirangistan. Here, Professor Cranebrook uh, published together with Firoz Kotwal a seminal work in four volumes between 1992 and 2009, making a very poorly difficult text, um, poorly transmitted text and difficult text in Avestan and Pahlavi available to an academic and non-academic readership. And this was actually the first publication with the translation of the Pahlavi version of, the, uh, of this text. Professor Grainbrook's collaboration with members of the Zoroastrian community has continued, and in particular, he worked with Shernaz Munshi um, on the living traditions of the Zoroastrians in India. And in this work, he was uh, crucially supported also by my colleague, Dr. Sarah Stewart. This work left to the, uh, led to the publication of a book entitled Living Zoroastrianisms, Living Zoroastrianism, urban Parsis speak about their religious lives. And as it happens, we have an exhibition on at SOAS at the moment with exactly this title. It actually, this title didn't, uh, 
it occurred to me after I'd thought of that title. There is this book by Professor Grainbrook on exactly this, uh, with exactly this title. And Professor Grainbrook has very graciously had no objection of us using this same title for the exhibition, which is currently on show. And you will all have the opportunity to see it after our proceedings have come to a conclusion here, as we will all go next door to the Brunei Gallery for a reception, and um, you can venture into the exhibition room, which is just ne next to it, next to the reception. Now, um, this work on living Zoroastrianism by Professor Cranebrook and uh, supported by Shenaz Munshi um, describes the reality of modern Parsi religions through 30 interviews. And in these interviews, Parsis uh, speak and Parsis who belong to different social milieus and religious uh, schools of thought and they discuss various aspects of their religious life. So here we get an amazing glimpse of uh, Zoroastrian thought um, of a contemporary, in the contemporary community. Another area of Professor Grainbrook's research is the religion of the Kurdish people, Yezidism in particular. The fruit of this work is his monograph on Yezidism, its background, observances, and textual tradition published in 1995, and is only one of his many outputs on the religion of the Yezidis. This particular volume is based on Professor Cranebrook's own fieldwork uh, with the Yezidi community in northern Iraq, and it includes texts and translations of 19 Yezidi hymns with a commentary uh, with a commentary on points of philological and theological interest. And this, this is the first ever publication of these materials, which up to then had been living only in their oral traditions. So Professor Cranebrook's work combines work on the written and on the spoken word. He is a great expert in both of them. And tonight he will speak to us on Zoroastrian studies and the question of orality. Please welcome Professor Greenbrook. Thank you very much, Professor Hinter, for those very kind words. Ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, first may I say how delighted I am to be here as the guest of the new SOA, Shapurji Palunji Institute for Zoroastrian Studies. Until recently, we could only hope and dream that something like the donation that gave rise to this institute would ever happen. And now the future of the study of Zoroastrianism is ensured, which is an enormous relief for most of us. Now, to come to the subject uh, of tonight, Zoroastrian studies and the question of orality, the fact that most Zoroastrian texts have been transmitted orally for many centuries is now theoretically recognized by most scholars, but the implications of that haven't always been um, truly taken into account by some, while others are looking for prescriptive general rules ruling oral literature in order to understand the workings of oral transmission, whilst most specialists on comparative oral literature are agreed that no such general rules exist. Many scholars of Zoroastrianism, therefore, are not sure how to deal with orality. As a colleague of mine once said, if we all went your way, we'd have nothing left to study, uh, with some, um, you know, was, was a bit worried about it. And what I'd like to do this evening is to convince you that that's far from the truth, and that ancient Zoroastrian studies can benefit very much from modern insights and approaches such as oral studies as it in itself and discourse analysis. To achieve that, we will always need philology as a key element of our study, but we should also keep in mind that the texts we have are merely expressions of a much wider and more complex Zoroastrian discourse than the ages, of which we can only catch the occasional glimpse. Now, first of all, I'd like to introduce these two methodological approaches I was talking about and the implications of, of their insights for Zoroastrian studies. Then, I would like to discuss the history of the transmission of some Zoroastrian texts, as I imagine it, taking into account the available uh, mechanisms for transmitting oral texts. You can't do that as you can do it when, when you've got books. 
After that, we can briefly discuss the way these texts were memorized and therefore conceptualized by ancient Zoroastrian priests. And then we can break the question as to to what extent we can gauge the history of an oral text. Normally, an, an oral text develops, and you can't just say very much. But the question is, can we do something in the case of Zoroastrianism? And that, because it's about Zoroastrianism, will bring us to the role of Zarathustra, the beginnings of Zoroastrianism. And I will end by proposing an imagined way, um, a way that the Garthas can be understood in the light of a number of these findings. Now, first, Discourse analysis. I'm not going to, to go deeply into the various ways into, uh, in which a lot of people now define and practice discourse analysis. DA is a philosophy that involves studying the way a certain phenomenon is spoken of and therefore made intelligible in a given culture over a certain amount of time. DA itself is a philosophy, not a methodology, but has given rise to some methodological approaches that can be helpful for Zoroastrian studies. What's most relevant here is that discourse analysis imagines every utterance, even what I'm saying now, as the result of a long and broad series of similar utterances, part of which have taken place here at SOAS, um, and the context in, 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 in which they, were, uh, they took place. If there had been no uh, such history, what I was saying would be incomprehensible. And Everything one says, according to discourse analysis, adds to the discourse. Nothing one says is neutral. Um, according to Foucault, who's a central figure in, in this field, the developments that such long and broad streams of discourse undergoes are governed by a set of rules, which are perhaps parameters. Um, premises of which the speaker may not be aware, but which determine what he can and cannot say about a certain subject. Foucault then says that these rules are generally um, determined by power. And he may be right. He's, he's very much into power, which I'm not. Written words are seen as manifestations of the discourse of a given time. So they're just part. They're crystallizations of something that is going on and has been going on for a long time and will have further uh, a, a future. Foucault stresses that there are usually breaks in the discourse. Nothing, things don't stay the same. There are things uh, change. And these, he says, are uh, generally connected with changes in power. Of course, the, most people who actively use and debate DA generally focus on very different discourses. But it seems to me that the fundamental in insights of discourse analysis can help us place the evidence of the Zoroastrian text in a clearer context. Also, whereas most students of modern discourse analysis have depth, we have length. We can imagine the extant written Zoroastrian texts as snapshots, as it were, of part of a much broader and more differentiated Zoroastrian discourse. That discourse, um, reflected by the text, shows some breaks in the tradition, but mostly we see a remarkable continuity from the prehistoric Garthas of Zarathustra, sometime before 1000 BCE, to the works of the Sasanian priests and beyond. So, after a time when academically new definitions of Zoroastrianism have become so wide as to be actually meaningless, we'll come back to this, we can now, I hope, adopt approaches based on discourse analysis and oral studies to help us rediscover the rules, the parameters that govern Zoroastrian discourse. We're coming to Zoroastrian oral studies where we find that there are currently two or three different lines, different types of Orientalists who f focus on Zoroastrian studies. On the one hand, there are those who work deductively, who believe that it's possible to discover prescriptive laws uh, governing orality, and who reason deductively. There are others who reject this approach completely and stress the need for an inductive approach when one that first examines each tradition separately. Scholars like Octa Sherva and Jean Kellens belong to the first group. Um, I, and I, I think Dr. Stewart, firmly belong to the second. Professor Hintz's work, examining the extent to which general uh, theories are applicable to Zoroastrian texts, combines deductive and inductive elements and comes to very interesting conclusions. 
Now, the background to this mini-schism uh, about orality, to only a few players, is as follows. In the 1930s, Milman Parry, at the time assistant professor at Harvard University, studied the, and recorded oral epic poetry in Bosnia in the Serbo-Croat language with the help of Albert Lord, his assistant. The resulting insights have come to be known as the parry lord theory. Briefly, they have shown that some epic bards uh, do not learn vast tra tracts of texts by heart, but learn the relevant themes of topoi, and they learn certain rules and tricks uh, of performance, which allows them to some extent to extemporize. Now, this is very interesting, and that is absolutely true, I'm sure, about the serbo croat epics, but it was then taken up by the classicists, especially at Harvard, and they understood Perry and Lord's findings not as referring to just the serbo croats but to all, general, um, all oral poetry, and they applied their findings to Homeric studies. Um, the resulting theories were hotly contested among Greek scholars, but they have a staunch advocate, a staunch defender in the Harvard professor, Dr. Gregory Nodge, who's a specialist on Homer and who is doing excellent work. I'm not saying anything against him because I think the, his theories are applicable to Homer. But the problem is that the Harvard Iranist, Dr. Shawe, best known for his purely philological work, was introduced to oral studies by Nodge. He then sought to apply what he believed to be, quote, the principles of oral literature, unquote, to the Avesta, which resulted in a number of publications, and particularly in a publication I rather regret, hymnic compositions of the, in the Avesta, 1994, which was promptly praised by Kellens, 1998, because, quote, it, it proposes a scheme of the history of the Avestan text based on the common laws of oral literature, unquote. Well, as you know, I don't believe such common norms exist. Here we have two scholars, well-known admirers of each, each other's work, accepting a general um, who, without any first-hand knowledge of the workings of oral transmission, have accepted a generalization of Parry and Lourdes' work and proceeded deductively to apply theories based on the, praxis, the practices of modern Serbo-Croat epic poets to the, religion, the religious traditions of ancient Iran. Outside Harvard, um, students of comparative oral literature have moved on and have generally come to the conclusion that few, if any, possible positive general rules can be formulated here. Each particular case needs to be studied inductively by a close examination about how the tradition functions and what its contents are. Contents are very important. Insights deriving from other culture may prove very helpful indeed. They often do, but it, this can only be accepted if it can be positively proven. In what follows, I will therefore start more or less from scratch on the basis of some familiarity with the modern academic literature on orality and of my first-hand experience of the transmission of the sacred literatures of the Yazidis and Yarasan or Ahlaha of Kurdistan. Now, what I would like to do in the rest of the lecture is first examine the question, what do we really mean by oral tradition? a term that is very often used in uh, Zoroastrian studies also. Secondly, the history of the texts, then the process of memorizing as we know it from the Avesta, the units of texts that were memorized, uh, the question of uh, the development um, of certain texts, particularly the Yashts, the question of Zoroast Zoroastrianization, I'm sorry, I mean the, the fact, that the extent to which Zoroastrian ideas were introduced to texts that originally were maybe pre or non Zoroastrian. Um, and then oral studies can add some as aspect to our understanding of Zarathustra, which I would like to share with you, which finally results um, partly because of a uh, a major uh, finding by Professor Hintzer, by a new, uh, in a new way of looking at the Garthas. Um, now first, oral tradition. It is quite misleading uh, because uh, the expression oral tradition is often used in Zoroastrian studies and elsewhere as an omnium gatherum for a number of different traditions which together constitute the whole discourse. There is, on the one hand, religious text, either memorized verbatim or memorized in a, in a free or freer transmission, 
not quite free, probably, as we shall see. Uh, priestly knowledge, which uh, again has at least two sides. There is an exegesis of a Western text already in the uh, Yasna, uh, Yasna uh, 19 to 21, but um, there is enough evidence to show that there was a, a great deal more general knowledge among the priesthood, which they transmitted among themselves. Then the third category, which may or may not be a category, but I think it, it is important, religious knowledge, as it was discussed or negotiated between priests and, and laity. It's not the case that the laity always just listened. I mean, one way of listening, which happens, which I've seen often uh, among Yazidis and others, is um, the priest holding forth and the um, audience listening uncritically, like being a told a story and they, they just accept whatever they're told. But on other occasions, we can see this. Uh, there must have been debate, and there must have been the audience must have been listened critically and saying, yes, but what about Nojum and um, astrology, for instance? I mean, in the Achaemenid period, they didn't have that, and suddenly it enters the tradition. Uh, that seems to be the result of interactions between priests and laity, and also interactions between the tra uh, Western tradition, the Zoroastrian tradition, and local culture, which took which, which played a role. Um, there is also purely lay discourse on religion, which uh, quite often repeats traditional knowledge, myths, stories, um, things about Zarathustra, how he laughed when he was born, I don't know, all these um, hagiographic things. But there was also discourse uh, concerning religion and society, which might be stated um, inspired, in my view. I've written about that a number of times that I believe the inscriptions are not so much objectively true as the result of what the, the kings wanted the laity or the people to believe. There's a, a religious aspect in that, but it's, it's very clear that um, that was a way of influencing a lay discourse. There was also sometimes discourse seeking a break in tradition, namely, for instance, Mazdak, who was, a, if you ask me, a uh, Zoroastrian priest who was very unhappy with the current situation and said this is not according to the teaching of Zoroastrianism and invoked the teaching of Zarathustra and created a revolution throughout the realm of Iran. Okay, after that, um, um, every uh, um, the continuity, I mean, the, every interest of the laity in um, the Zand, in the, in the tradition, was cut short because the king said, and now a laity are not allowed to learn the Zand. And that continues, but we can't go into that too much, unfortunately, because there's no time. Um, now, we come to the history of the text. First of all, what we can, I think, say with certainty is that the Indo-Iranian tradition, the common tradition of the ancient Indians and ancient Iranians, or proto-Indians, proto-Iranians, whatever, were, um, can contained, on the one hand, mantic poetry, um, meaning um, texts that formulated hidden truths in order to compel the divinities, as it were, uh, to do what the poet wanted, and other um, poems which main, mainly um, praised the divinities and told them they were wonderful and told the, the, the people what these divinities had done. Now, Zoroastrian discourse begins with Zarathustra's message, which, as we shall see, constituted a clear break uh, in the Indo-Iranian religious discourse. We also see that, in contrast to other texts that continued to be transmitted freely, the Garthas and the Yasnahab Tanhaiti were memorized verbatim from an early stage, and their language was never consciously adapted to the na uh, natural speech of those who recited them later. Those texts are said to be in old Avestan, other texts, whose language continued to evolve together with the nat natural language of the people, and whose text came to be fixed later, are said to be in young Avestan. After a time of development in the mid-6th century BCE, Zoroastrianism can be seen to have come to the Achaemenid Empire, to Persia, to from the east to the west. And in Persia, a different language was spoken, or different languages. They didn't speak Avesta. But Avestan continued to be the sacred language of the Zoroastrian tradition, in spite of 
everything. I mean, that, that's very interesting that the uh, great powerful state of the Achaemenids did not say, oh, well, but now you're going to speak another language. They said, no, this is your sacred language. And uh, that is how it continued. Now, probably initially the priests representing Zoroastrianism in Persia were probably native speakers of Hephaestus or people who at least had a good active command of that language. But there was also at that time an established native priestly class in Western Iran, the priestly speaking, the Persian speaking Magush. I'll, I, I won't be going on about Old Persian, Middle Persian, New, new Persian. It, it, there are forms of Persian. Obviously, um, under the Achaemenians, Persian was Old Persian. But I mean, I don't, don't want to, to do it all the time because it gets boring. Um, so the Persian speaking Magush and an Elamite priesthood, the Shatin. And as Zoroastrianism, with its Avestan liturgy, expanded, these other priesthoods apparently joined the new religious movement, if it was that, the, the development that gave rise to Zoroastrianism becoming the main religion in Western Iran. So let's call it um, um, a religious movement. Well, that meant they were required to recite Avestan liturgical text. But in... Um, Unlike the Indians, the Iranians don't seem to have developed uh, the any theoretical knowledge about language, so they had no technical means of teaching a foreign language. I mean, they could learn them by going somewhere, but for the whole Western Iranian priesthood, it was probably impossible to learn a Western um, uh, as a, a, a language, so that you have a complete command. So instead, what they did instead of learning young Avestan, which would have allowed them to continue the tradition, making additions to it, or then saying, well, this is no longer relevant, so we leave this out, they uh, started learning um, uh, to, uh, it by, by heart, the, the whole text by heart, uh, word for word. So not just the Gathas, which had always been um, recited, probably syllable by syllable, but now... I think, in, in, in the Achaemenid period, the other Avestan texts were also um, taught that way. And that meant that a body of text that had so far been transmitted rather more freely now came to be transmitted in, in a fixed form, although there was still no way of writing Avestan. As it became ever more difficult to, to understand this ancient Avestan language, um, the priesthood solved the problem by developing a somewhat primitive method of translating an Avestan word with a fixed Persian equivalent. And teaching this translation, which was a bit problematic but comprehensible, um, to, uh, as the basis of advanced priestly studies, here at Bedestan. Eventually, it was not just the Avestan text and the translation, but um, important commentaries by prominent teachers became a fixed part of the text to be memorized. So Middle Persian translation and commentary were called zand, explanation, or indeed exegesis. Later again, in Sasanian times, a system was developed for writing a Western adequately. That had not existed earlier, which meant that until then, it had probably been impossible to read an unknown a Western text from the page. I mean, there must have been attempts to write a Western in cuneiform or in whatever, but I mean, it, it wouldn't have been possible if you didn't know the text to uh, read, say, Middle Persian and say, well, I can read it. Um, so, until then, once a text had ceased to be recited, it was lost forever. But, now that there was a, a, an alphabet, um, a, a book, a, 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 a collection of sacred text, Came to be, which came to be known as Abestav, was written down. Was written down, and the idea was that this was the holy book of the Zoroastrians, which hadn't existed until then. That was the din, the, the tradition of which the priests knew and which other people didn't know. But now there was um, a sacred book. There is a theory uh, that the word Abestav uh, meant testament, and that the word was um, borrowed directly from the Christians. Um, because there was no word for such a book. I, I think it's, it's very likely, but a colleague of mine who's a specialist on Greek says, yes, but they used a different word for the, the testament. I don't know. But it seems to me that if it isn't true, it was uh, well invented. 
Um, then we come to what these uh, priests actually memorized. As you know, the Zoroastrian priesthood is hereditary, and in priestly families, the children, the sons at least, were made to memorize the liturgical text at an early age, and were generally taught by their parents, by, by their fathers, or by someone else in the family, as the Avesta says. Now, what, how, the, the way they did it, oh gosh, uh, well, this is what I was just saying, I'm sorry. Um, the first, um, the candidate had to just listen to the teacher reciting the texts. Uh, that was Fra Mar, concentrating, maybe counting the words, but I think Fra Mar really in Middle Persian means concentrating on, I mean, giving your, your full attention to something. When that phase was over, they uh, were allowed to recite the word, holy words softly, carefully, not to make it so careful, not to make it sound like a formal utterance. Because as you know, if you um, pray a Western uh, formally uh, the, uh, and you make a mistake, that's a grave sin. So that had to be um, avoided and people drnjaya. Drnjaya is uh, something that's definitely not, uh, not official, um, proper, Avestan. After that, they were allowed to srawaya, to recite, to recite formally, um, the way Zarathustra is said to have recited the Gathas the first time, that was srawaya, it wasn't yaz. Uh, but if that was all right, and they could, uh, they were really word perfect, they could also take part in rituals and serve, um, allow the, uh, to, they were allowed to perform it ritually, that is yaz. Now, if you think back to the Serbo-Croats, uh, much praised by Shavo, I mean, they extemporize. If, if you have this process of learning texts, of uh, going, I mean, all liturgical texts were learned that way. It's hard to see how people would extemporize later on. So I don't believe in that. Anyway, uh, you, the um, units of a Western text, I mean, it's, it's, it stands to reason, really. I mean, first one learned a verse, God save our uh, gracious queen. Then a number of verse lines. When they were, uh, knew the first, first verse, then they came to a stanza or vachashtashti, God save our noble queen, God save our queen. That's sort of a stanza. Um, and we find them in, in, in the text. We, we see that those units exist. Then, in the case of some texts, a number of those stanzas, Vastas Dashti, belonging together, formed a Yasno Karati, which is a, 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 a ritual, really, a, a, the performance of a small a ritual of praise, but which, in fact, um, later was called a Karte. A Karte is a part of the text uh, which is coherent, or meant to be co coherent in itself, and ends with a characteristic conclusion uh, et cetera, et cetera, and then ending with a young tongue. Finally, sequence of a number of those characters, or rather longer sequences of texts, um, were, meant, uh, were also uh, sort of um, learned by heart, and those are now known, now known as yasht, him, or if they formed part of the yasna as a haiti, or ha, or that's a chapter. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Now, when uh, will we see that these uh, categories really worked in the tradition? For instance, um, we occasionally see a single verse line emerging in more than one place. This is much more normal for a stanza or verse. You find them uh, here, there, and everywhere. Not, no, not, not that, but you find them in appropriate places uh, more than once. It sometimes uh, occur, uh, you, you find the same or a very similar karde in different yashts, suggesting that those uh, units exist, existed in the minds of the priests in a fixed form and could be used as part of larger, tech, larger units. As to these larger units, for instance the yasht, which are quite long, most of them, uh, from the point of view of content, First lines and stanzas are usually logically coherent. I mean, it's clear what is being said. The same is true of most, though not all, kardes. But on the other hand, when you look at the structure of many yasht, you find a very different picture. 
The same passage may occur twice in the same yasht, and again in a different yasht. Yasht 10, Kadeh 8, 8 and 13. Yasht 17, Kadeh 4. Contradictory images uh, occur next to each other, while Kadeh is dealing with the same aspect of a yazata's nature, may be strewn more or less all over a yasht. That could mean, and that is only a theory, I can't prove it, but it seems to me logical, that original texts used to praise the yazatas in pre-Achaemenian times were much shorter, that the ritual uh, uh, themselves could be maybe shorter, um, than our yasht, and in fact consisted of one or more kardes, and that different kardes were transmitted in different families. Obviously, in, the priests didn't interact with each other. In, in, in a priestly family, one transmitted one's knowledge. And since uh, priests in Khorasan were not in touch with priests in Pars, they would have developed different karde. Um, now the next, so the yasht might then have been composed on the basis of a collection of karde um, praising a particular yazata from different traditions, which were put together as best the composers could, which was not an easy ta task. The next question would then be when and why the long yash were composed. Logically, this would have been impossible during the time uh, the texts were memorized at a young age and transmitted in separate families over huge stretches of territory. Um, but there is, uh, there, there simply would not, would not have been a way in, in oral transmission you can't just, I mean, the, the government can't say, and now we're going to uh, use a different version of the Bible or so, because they, those books are not available. Uh, you can't reach people who have memorized a text in a certain way and w wish to continue memorizing in that way. But there is one point I can see, um, a bottleneck point in the history of Zoroastrianism, where this might have happened, namely during the Achaemenid period, when, if I'm right, an, uh, comparatively small number of native Avestan speakers taught Avestan texts to a much larger number of Western Iranian priests, Magus and Shatim. And they memorized the text verbatim as they were taught them, and then passed them on to their children. Now that generation, or under those circumstances, uh, priests could have ta been taught a new group of texts, a newly formed group of texts, in such a way that a longer type of yasht was introduced. It seems to me the only possible um, time and contingency where this could happen. Also, of course, um, we see it will. Yes, we see that um, the sequence of the yasht, as we know them, follows that of the days of the calendar, and the calendar was probably instituted, as we know, in Achaemenid times. So, presumably, um, the yazatas of the calendar now had to be praised with their own yasht on their name day, and that yasht had, been, had to be a bit elaborate, not just, oh, we, we worship Mithra, thank you very much, but, I mean, Mithra is fantastic, Mithra is great, Mithra did this, and then a long thing, because that was agreeable to Mithra, I suppose. Um, so, as a hypothesis, I would suggest that this is when short characters in praise of different yazatas, of which there must have been a great many, were combined into what we know as the yashts. Now, if we study the yasht, we also see that a corpus of verses dedicated to a yazata can often be preceded by a few verses showing the overlordship of Ahura Mazda over that divinity. Ahura Mazda, I think, created Mithra and said, uh, we're good. Um, Ahura Mazda did something to Agvisura Anahit. I can't remember he, whether he created her or greeted her, but I mean, you find at the beginning, typically at the beginning, which is easy to remember, not in the middle, which is more difficult in all texts, you find these, um, these texts. Mm. That suggests that older texts could, um, could continue to be recited, more or less as usual, but some verses referring to key elements of Zoroastrian beliefs could be added to them, a process that I would like to call Zoroastrianization, partly because Kellens accuses me of be believing in Zoroastrianization, which, in his view, is terrible. Um, I uh, do indeed believe in such a thing, but academically speaking, the gradual realization that the extant Zoroastrian texts do not represent all Zoroastrian discourse has led, led a number of scholars to claim that uh, 
any ancient religion, religious phenomenon in the Iranian realm must uh, be Zoroastrian, and that we're not capable of ever distinguishing between what is typically Zoroastrian and not typically Zoroastrian. The lamented and dear friend Patricia Crone go so far as to state that the belief in reincarnation and in the manifestation of divine beings in human form could have formed part of what she calls provincial Zoroastrianism. In other words, to use discourse analysis, in Crone's view, Zoroastrian discourse developed without any perceptible rules. It could go any which way. Uh, there were no boundaries. Um, and... Um, as far as the teachings were concerned. Now, much as I appreciate Patricia Crane's work, I find it fantastic, but here I beg to differ. If one accepts that Zoroastrianism represented a clear break in the Indo-Iranian religious tradition, beginning with Zarathustra, and that its rules, its, its parameters, gradually affected all religious texts, or many religious texts recited by Zoroastrians, then, to me, it seems to follow that although the boundaries of Zoroastrian beliefs were definitely wider than was once thought, and the continu continuity found in the texts suggests that certain boundaries did very much exist. Such topoi as Ahura Mazda himself, to my view, is a uh, Zoroastrian divinity, only Zoroastrian. The Amisha Spintas, the key opposition between good and evil, the idea of a judgment after this life, as well as quotations from the Gathas and references to Zarathustra, can, in my view, all be regarded as typically Zoroastrian elements. Reincarnation, I'm sorry, cannot. Of course, if that is true, uh, it's only relevant if there was truly such a thing as Zoroastrianism um, and not just a, a vague movement that happened to believe in uh, a person who didn't really exist but who was four persons. And But, uh, uh, well, I'm trying to imitate Kellens. I can't because I've never, never really understood him. But if, if, if we believe that there was such a figure as Zarathustra, um, we can wonder what oral studies and discourse analysis can add to our knowledge of him. Now, we know that the poetry of Zarathustra is relatively similar uh, in style and content to the ancient and Indian Vedic texts, and that after centuries of developing a shared religious tradition, the proto-Indians and proto-Iranians then separated and had been apart for some considerable time at the time when Zarathustra lived. So since Zarathustra does it, um, does a uh, composed mantic verses, we may legitimately conclude that the Indo-Iranian tradition of composing new mantic verses that used well-formulated truth as a means to force the gods to comply with the poet's wishes must have existed among the Iranians before Zarathustra. It is clearly, in an oral culture, he can only have learned this priestly craft from living teachers, as there were no books available. And so, we may assume that this tradition of, of, of composing mantic poetry must have gone on among the Iranians, otherwise Zarathustra wouldn't, wouldn't have been able to do it. Now in the Veda, the words of great seers were memorized together with the names of the authors. Um, uh, so in, in, in a cognate uh, Indo-Iranian tradition, the names of many seers are remembered until this day. And Zarathustra must have learned his craft from these earlier seers who did this. And presumably, um, so if that is so, why do the extant Iranian texts not mention any other seers or attribute any text to them, or any good seers? There are one or two evil ones, the wicked so and so. But uh, I mean, we find only references to Zarathustra. Their oral studies has a good solution because we know that in Kurdistan there is uh, quite often the question of conscious forgetting. Two tribes that have been at war with each other and had songs um, calling each other, I don't know what, and b uh, bad names and saying how terrible the enemy was, make peace. And the bards consciously say, no, no, we won't uh, recite those songs anymore because uh, that's not good. So there is such a thing as deciding not to repeat certain uh, things in oral t tradition and once one generation stops repeating it, the tradition is gone. Again, no books. Um, 
So, together with the fact that the Gathas were memorized verbatim, which suggests that they were particularly holy or potent, we also see that instead of the Indo-Iranian tradition of naming all previous authors of successful text, older Iranian mantras are deliberately forgotten, consciously omitted, presumably because only Zarathustra's texts were felt uh, worthy of being used, used to address the divinities. So Zarathustra's status in early Zoroastrianism may have been fundamentally different from that of the Indo-Iranian seers, or from that of the Veda, because he was seen as the only figure believed to have perceived the will of the Ahuras. We might even speak of the first um, Indo-Iranian prophet, but I wouldn't, um, well, you know, commit myself to that because I, I leave it to people who know what exactly a prophet is. But it, it seems to me it was a very, very special figure in the Indo-Iranian tradition. Now we come then to the Gathas, um, where we have to understand this, uh, some points. I've already mentioned the truth mantra, which is very much the genre that Zarathustra uses. He shows um, the God, the gods, that he knows the hidden truth, and therefore he asks them to help him. But there's another thing that is quite interesting. In a recent work, Kianush Rezanya, now professor in Bochum, has shown that in Zarathustra's view, the, there are two times, and we know that, there are two times, an endless time in Zoroastrianism and a limited time. Now, we have always thought that that meant you had endless time, endless time, and then break, there is limited time, end of limited time, and it goes on. What he has proven, and which is borne out by the traditions of the Yazidis and the Ahl Haq, that this is not true. In our time, the two realities coexist at the same time, and uh, very much of religious poetry has to do with the interaction between our earthly sphere and this absolute sphere. Um, as I understand this, Rezanya has just said, uh, this, uh, said this about an endless and limited time, but as I understand it, Zarathustra believed in the simultaneous existence of two different modes of reality, an essential, unchanging reality, which was typically the sphere of Ahura Mazda, and the mundane, changing reality that we experience on Earth. Um, Ahura Mazda created the fundamental laws, mantras, which I like to translate by, as algorithms, um, governing uh, this temporary state, state, but he's hardly ever depicted as interfering in, in it directly, at least not in the Gathas. Uh, once or twice there is a, a reference, but normally he stays in his sphere, and the angels, the Amishas Pantas and other Yazatas, especially Mithra and Srasha, can move from one sphere to the other. A gifted mantic priest can also reach the eternal from the temporary sphere by means of his sacred poetry. In his formulation, if his formulation of truth is exceptional, it may bring about direct contact with the supernatural. All right, now something uh, which might interest you, which I find interesting um, to illustrate the use of um, the discourse uh, analysis. There's, this is an article by uh, Philip Graham, uh, Thomas Keenan, and Anne-Marie Dowd on the uh, hist uh, historical analysis of George W. Bush's declaration of war on terror. Um, where they say they compare uh, George B Bush's uh, George Bush's declaration of war with uh, speeches by Pope Urban II from 1095, Queen Elizabeth I, and Adolf Hitler, no less, to exemplify the structure, function, and historical significance of such texts in Western society over the last millennium. And they identify four generic features that could have endured in such texts throughout this period. Those are an appeal to legitimate power, uh, to a legitimate power source outside the orator, and which is presented as inherently good, say Ahura Mazda. An appeal to the historical importance of the culture in which the discourse is situated. May uh, the evil spirit not um, um, break the order of the world a second time. The construction of a thoroughly evil other, such as Angra Manu, and an appeal for unification behind the legitimating external power source, in this case, possibly Zarathustra. Now, 
as I see it, I mean, you could see this coming. It's not a surprise. I think this is not just uh, relevant for, to understand George Bush. It also makes sense uh, when one studies the Garthas. So we can say about Zarathustra that he was, I mean, he was calling people to arms. He was probably not calling the Yazatas to arms. He was calling his own people to arms. Um, so he wanted to motivate his followers to engage in a conflict with a group that he regarded as religiously misguided. First of all, that means uh, a break in uh, traditional discourse, because as Bernd Fried Schlierat has already seen, Vedic texts are always addressed exclusively to the gods. And in the, ca in the case of the, Zarat of the Gatha, Zarathustra is both seeking to address the divinities with formulations of truth, but this, at the same time he's presenting his message to his followers, seeking to convince them of the truth of his teachings and calling them to arms to follow him. That's another major break. Um, and as Professor Hint has remarked, if Zarathustra was conveying a message to his human audience, then they m must be understandable, they must be comprehensible to that audience, which implies that if we're lucky, it may be possible for us to catch at least a glimpse. Now, uh, l the last element is something that all oralists would have thought, and that until Professor Hintzer came along, no philologists believed, because we were taught that the sequence of the Garthas was uh, an artificial one, the sequence uh, based on meter. That was, I mean, that was gospel. Now, Professor Hintze, um has used philology to prove that the sequence we have uh, was in, indeed there at a very early time, if not the original one. It was probably the original one. This is part of oral studies as well, as oralists would have said, yes, there's no way someone who learns these difficult texts by heart and usually repeats them every night so as not to forget them, would suddenly start changing sequences. But uh, that's all an oralist could have said, Professor Hintze, um, has shown that this is um, the case, that we have the proper um, sequence of texts. And that helps us, that's a key insight, which allows us to look at the Garthas in a new way, focusing on the actual contents, like looking at Yasna 28 as a beginning. So now I have to get out of here and do something else. I'm sorry, I'll find it. Um, this is as the, um, is this, this visible? No, 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 no it's, it's getting, can you, uh, okay. Well, this is my summary of the Garthos. I've been working on the Garthos for the past six years or so and quite hard since I retired. I'm not saying that my translations and interpretations are better, but they do make sense in terms of what I uh, believe the, the texts were about. So we can, we can look at it, and then I'm, I'm trying to show you that most of the Gartha, Garthas can be understood as uh, the, the liturgy of a ritual in its own right, with a mysterious culmination, the Yasna Abdang Haiti, which uh, we can discuss. First, we have, before the actual Garthas begin, we have the end of uh, Yasna 27, prayers, Yatha Hu Varyo, Ashem Vohu, Yeng Tam, prayers mostly to the gods. Um, not so much for the uh, people, it's um, their, their prayers for God to understand. Then we begin Yasna 28, which indeed begins as a, as an, uh, as a beginning. Zarathustra, with outstretched hands, announces that he's a knowledgeable priest who intends to compose new mantic poetry for Mazda. And if Mazda comes to Zarathustra's aid by inspiring him, then Zarathustra will help uh, to make the world as it was in the beginning. Zarathustra is saying time and time again, the gods want the good things, but they need people to realize them in this world because they can't, they haven't got the physical power. Now, the next uh, thing, the next um, ha, I'm, uh, that has been quite often neglected by scholars because here we have um, to do with a cow speaking. And many of my colleagues found that, found that embarrassing and thought, I mean, a prophet who says that a cow can speak. Um, I have uh, a different way, in, in my view, this is a key uh, text, a theodicy. A theodicy is a statement as to why God means well, even though 
there are horrible things in this world. I think the fundamental problem here is defined by, by, by using the plight of the cow at the hands of the other party as a, uh, an example. Now, the creator of the cow, who is a sort of advocate of the cow, who can talk to Mazda, asks Mazda why the cow is subjected to such maltreatment. And then Ahura Mazda says something very important to my mind, a key pronunciation. He says that he has created a good mantra algorithm for the cow. Namely, the cow was made for fat and milk, and that was good. But uh, what is lacking is a ratu, is someone to make it all right, to, to cause a rata, irta, uh, to come to earth. And that, uh, we are led to understand, might well be that uh, ideal ratu, Zaratustra. Well, why not? Um, so God has created perfect fundamental laws for the world in his absolute sphere, but in our temporary sphere, it's up to humans to implement those in the correct correct way so that God's will can be done. Meaning God is ideal, God is absolute but in this world there is a problem and it can only be um, fought for by humans. Immediately after that it is uh, totally logical is an explanation. Why is that? Well that is because there are two forces in the world good and evil, two principles. They were seen as, in a, as twins in a dream. Um, those who make the wrong choice following the principle of evil, and that is gods as well as men, quite unlike the Veda. I mean, I've never heard of, of sinful gods. But anyway, maybe you have. Um, and the, uh, ruin the world and will eventually be punished. Now, this is clearly a formulation of truth, but it seems to be addressed primarily to a human audience and not so much the Yazatas who presumably knew this, but for the audience it must have been quite a shocking idea that the world was not as the gods wanted it, but in fact there were two. There was an evil power as well as a good one uh, in the world. Um, now that's the cause of the problem. Zarathustra then says he and his theories will win Ahura Mazda's approval because he recites true words and asks for f further help. He begins asking rhetorical questions, leading the audience to understand that um, Zarathustra's theory is right and that the opponents do not adhere to the right beliefs and will come to a bad end. Then 32 is, as one, one could imagine, is almost uh, a discourse on sin. The text introduces the concept of, of sin as exemplified by the wicked Grahma, who is a wicked person, I don't quite know what he did. And then sin, he says, it is implied, is inherent in the world because even the good Yima, Jamshid eventually became sinful and was therefore removed. But sin here is mostly firmly associated with the Daiwa worshippers who will face punishment. Never mind the Yasna 48, but we can't go into that. I mean, there are uh, many correspondences between different, different texts, but uh, that's true. Then, again, something which I, I think is, is essential for understanding Zarathustra's view. He's not uh, Muhammad, who says, I'm, I'm, I'm a nobody, please, I'm your slave, God. He says, I'm a, I'm a person. I mean, nothing against Islam, but I mean, I'm just saying that uh, in, in uh, Abrahamic religions, mostly men are small and God is all, almighty. Here, he says, well, we're the only, only ones who can uh, actually carry out your things, you Ahura Mazda, you must understand that, and we can't do it without you. Uh, he says... That Zarathustra is a ratu who acts in accordance with primeval laws, and because he's a good ritual priest, his act of worship will allow the divinities to acquire the physical strength um, if they come to attend. In this way, Zarathustra strengthens the divinity while they must give him aid. So it's a do ut des. I mean, it's, it's an interaction between the two. Um, and then something very spectacular happens at least to me, maybe to you. Yeah, well, I find it very spectacular. Here we have uh, a text that uh, says there is something important coming. It begins by indicating that a key point in the ritual has now been prepared, goes on to describe aspects of the ritual as if they were about to occur and would result in a direct contact with Ahura Mazda through which the world might become ideal. Now, one could read the latter part of the text as an announcement of an imminent trance-like state of vision. He says, when I'm asleep. And it is always, well, he can't go, go to sleep when he's doing a ritual, so it can't be sleep, but supposing it is something like sleep. 
um, will, when I'm asleep, uh, Zarathustra hopes to perceive the great truths. And then climax, intermission. Zarathustra is silent, stops, is somewhere else. But we have another text, a text that um, is not the same genre as the, uh, the Gathas, which is its ritual prose rather than poetry. It is the community speaking, or a community speaking, Yazamaide, we worship so and so, we think this and that, we think, not Aura Mazda, um, Zarathustra saying, me. Um, no call to action, rather an affirm affirmation of belief in Aura Mazda and other key elements of Zoroastrian. There's no question of, oh well, we're very much against the Dayamas itself, we believe in this, we believe in that, we, we worship all uh, manner of things. Professor Hintze then has very um, interestingly suggested that this moment, at this moment, a fire might be lit because fire imagery is very strong in this. This is quite true. I mean, I don't know, but it, it could well be true, and it's a very interesting point. I thought that maybe simultaneously Zarathustra might be having a vision. I mean, it might be a reenactment of what priests do all the time of the time that Zarathustra, who saw a vision coming, actually had this vision and was therefore silent, where other other people, the community, um, well, uh, entertained, I, 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 well, you know what I mean. I mean, they, they entertained the divers, they, they had to say something. So that then there comes an interesting text, which is not part of the Yasnaab Tanghaiti, which we shall skip here. Uh, but then we go back to a new Gatha, the, the second Gatha, this, um, the Ushtavaiti, which um, tells us about an approach and a vision. There is an introductory passage where I'm a bit bothered by a, a, an aorist subjunctive, Meng Hai, which I'm, I can't place quite. But anyway, it is, it is as though he repeats that he was looking for uh, a, a vision, but then immediately afterwards, there is someone. Uh, he asked Mazda to let him be in touch with the long life, which is an expression also used elsewhere, meaning presumably the absolute world. Um, I'm overrunning, I'm, I'm uh, nearly finished. Then someone approaches him, interrogates him, and apparently causes him to realize many hidden things. Um, Zarathustra, quote, was instructed about the primeval stage. He prays for foresight, khratu, which Mazda can give and which will help Zarathustra achieve Mazda's purposes. Next, Ha goes on about the revelation. But Ha, Zarathustra is now in direct contact with Mazda, asking him rhetorical and real questions through which he also expands his own worldview to his hearers. And gradually, he comes away from the vision and he begins to talk about the community. He says that uh, there has to be a good community and that the Daivas were never good rulers and other communities are not worth a fig. I mean, we must be, you know. Um, then, um, once more, the fundamental opposition between good and evil is in, in the light, presumably here, of Zarathustra's recent vision. There's a clear references to a, com to a community again. Uh, like-minded people, opposition between good and wicked communities is stressed, and there's an ex explicit exposition of Zarathustra's teaching. He then sums up the teachings towards the end of that Gatha. Uh, we're clearly, clearly past the culmination of uh, the ceremony, and Zarathustra aims to link the social and political affairs of his community to the insight he's just gained. New Gatha on the great role of Spinta Mainyu. Spinta Mainyu, who's the lord of this world, um, not Ahura Mazda. Ahura Mazda is above our world. Mary Boyce would, wouldn't believe this, but I think it's absolutely true. Um, Ahura Mazda is, uh, oversees everything but cannot interfere directly. Spinta Mainyu is the, lord of, the good lord of this world, and he is on the side of the writers. The original perfect order of the world which he represented was upset by the evil one. Ahura Mazda, it said again, has created the laws governing the world and in doing so has established the fundamental laws of the Daina, which maybe mean the way Zarathustra sees things. Um, then sin again. Again, we come back, uh, our themes come back. The we not the Grahma this time, but the wicked Bandwa who's stolen Zarathustra's grain, if I'm not mistaken, and wicked people generally. That is... Uh, we know by now, but then he um, introduces his patrons, 
which is fairly typical at the end of a text in Indian literature. I mean, he want, uh, well, people want money or uh, rewards from the patrons, and they start, when they come to the end, they start mentioning the patrons, and he does it here. He uh, shows them his power to communicate. And then at the end of that Gatha, Zarathustra asks for reward for his skills and suggests the ritual is ending. I shall send you the best mantras, ask for rewards. Um, and that is the last of that Gatha, which already suggests an ending. But this ending uh, is, is very clear in the next Gatha, which is only one ha, uh, which is, the to my mind, the conclusion of the ritual. Summing up the message, good versus evil, may Ahura Mazda reward the good, Zarathustra's patrons are mentioned. Again, very clearly, more clearly than that. I think that is indeed the end of the ritual because there's a, a Yasta 53, which I can, absolutely can't do anything with. I mean, I've tried, but it seems to me uh, strange. And the same is true of a recent author, M.L. West. Uh, unfortunately, he's died. Um, in the hymns of Zarathustra, who said, this may be the only Gatha that's not by Zarathustra. I'm not saying it, but I mean, I, could, I, I, I can imagine he may be right. In any case, um, that uh, Yasna 53 is not part of my idea of this ritual. Um, the last Gatha is only the Aryaman Isho prayer, which harks back to the beginning, where there were prayers typically to the gods. Here it's uh, a prayer for the community. So... I'm coming to the end. You must be very relieved to hear it. Um, to sum up, in the, in the light of the methodological approach that we've discussed, the Gathas and Yasna Tahiti can be understood as an early liturgy in their own right, constructed around a climatic, climactic event, possibly the lighting of a fire, or perhaps originally a reenactment of Zarathustra's original moment of vision. All this invites further question about many things, but I hope I've convinced you that a modern approach to Zoroastrian studies may be worth trying. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Grainbrook, for this enlightening lecture, taking us through all of the gathas and many aspects of this fascinating Zoroastrian tradition, which has so much depth to it that uh, invites us to explore uh, all the various aspects of it. And we see more and more the significance of the orality that underlies this, uh, this tradition up to the present day.